Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, welcome to this webinar this afternoon. Um, can I just introduce you to our two presenters today who are here with us in Stirling. Um, we've got Steve Brown and Anne Morgan Thomas. Um, I'm sure some of you will know them already. Um, but anyway, I'll go through their biographies for you so you can see all the fascinating things that they've done up to now. Um, Steve Brown started his career in English language teaching as a volunteer in Mongolia before joining International House and taking on a range of fixed term posts in Romania, Czech Republic, Hungary and South Africa. 2001, he came back to Scotland to do an MSc in Applied Linguistics at Edinburgh University. Um, and from there, he took on a number of temporary positions in colleges and universities in Glasgow before getting a full-time post at Langside College, where he worked as an ESOL lecturer and trainer on the Trinity Dip TESOL program. In 2005, Steve moved to Clydebank College, where he worked as cur curriculum leader for the languages department. He took a short break from FE and worked for the British Council in Malaysia, where he did more work as a CELTA trainer before returning to Clydebank in time for the merger and the formation of West College Scotland. Currently, he's working as a curriculum and quality leader for the languages department across all the three campuses of West College Scotland. And in his spare time, which I'm sure he doesn't have much of, he's also studying for a doctorate of education at the University of Glasgow. He's particularly interested in effective approaches to language program design and is also currently researching the role of ESOL as a potential source of emancipation for immigrant communities in Scotland. Our next presenter is Anne Morgan Thomas, who started her career in English language teaching in 1976 in Poland. She came back to Scotland in 1977 and managed a project at the Women's International Centre in Edinburgh to set up community-based ESOL classes and creches. In 1986, she took up a post as a full-time ESOL lecturer at Stevenson College in Edinburgh, teaching on a wide range of ESOL and TESOL courses over the years in a number of different posts. She left the college in 2012, where she was head of ESOL and languages. During that period of time, she had two secondments to SQA, one of which was to develop the SQA ESOL qualifications framework. She was also a senior verifier with the RSA for ESOL and TESOL before working for SQA as an ESOL senior verifier. She's also worked as an HMI Associate Assessor for Languages and ESOL. Anne has delivered a lot of training, carried out consultancy work, and managed a wide range of projects for a variety of organizations, both in the UK and abroad, including Sweden, Denmark, Holland, Estonia, Latvia, South Africa, Brazil, and India. She's currently the Principal Verifier for the SQA NQ ESOL, and SQA NQ Lead Verifier. So we've got a hugely experienced set of presenters here with us today. So I'd like to just hand over to Steve, who's going to start the presentation. OK, thank you very much, Suzanne. What we're going to do, um, I'm going to start by giving a bit of a uh, contextual sort of background in terms of uh, uh, how my in my own experiences over the last few years um, of what has kind of led me and, and my colleagues at West College Scotland to be delivering uh, in a kind of project based way um, I'll give you some examples of some of the projects that we have uh, delivered and um, just to give you a flavor of the kind of thing that we're talking about and then I want to focus on the uh, benefits of uh, taking a project-based approach in terms of language acquisition um, and how uh, using a project-based approach can be a very effective way of, of, uh, of inputting and delivering language. Um, I'll have a few conclusions to my part and then I'll be passing you on to Anne who is going to look uh, more about how uh, project 
project work can be used to generate evidence which can then be used um, for uh, uh, the delivery of some of the SQA ESOL assessments and ESOL units. So uh, that's basically the, the, the way that we're going to go. Now, um, if I give you a bit of uh, background, this is this is basically where we are back back in the days before West College Scotland existed, and uh, I was working at Clyde Bank College. Our ESOL curriculum looked pretty much like this. Uh, we had uh, a large proportion of our of our program was was made up of what we called general English, um, and it was basically following a course book. Um, and and delivering the, the, the types of well the, the kind of language that you find in your in your generic uh, uh, global course books um, and uh, in addition to that that was being supplemented by uh, the old uh, SQA accredited ESOL units um, and the, the content there was very much focused on uh, preparing them for the NABs as we used to call them um, and that was that was pretty much all we were doing, uh, I say all. I mean, it, it seemed valuable enough. You know, we were uh, we had a you know we had a, a solid grounding in terms of our syllabus with with the course book. Um, we were focusing on areas of language that we felt were were important, and other people would regard them as important because they're in course books. And we were also giving them the opportunity to get some ESOL qualification from their program as well. However, you know, since then, um, as you are probably aware, the uh, FE sector has undergone quite a, a lot of change, and um, a number of key drivers were starting to impact on us, and were starting to uh, make it clear to us that we were going to have to uh, make some adjustments to our curriculum in order to address a lot of these key drivers. Uh, one of these drivers for change was really this the need for accreditation um, in the FE sector at the moment there is a uh, there's a general sense that that, that um, you, if you're not if you're delivering something to your students and it doesn't lead towards an accredited outcome then the, that perhaps raises questions as to its legitimacy um, and also potentially some issues with regard to funding um, Funding Council is obviously on, only going to uh, fund programs that um, it regards as, as being worth funding. And as you know, they are perhaps being a little bit more careful uh, in their scrutiny of, uh, of programs. And so we just wanted to make sure that um, our programs would continue to be uh, uh, receiving uh, funding from the Funding Council. And you know, we needed to make sure that they were our programs were going to be regarded as as legitimate and worthwhile um, with all the various stakeholders. Um, obviously, another key factor that's impacting on on ESOL provision in Scotland, or perhaps the most important one, is the adult ESOL strategy, which uh, was first developed in 2007 but has been recently refreshed. Um, and if you look at some of the uh, the objectives in the refreshed strategy, in particular, there's a Quite a heavy focus on the need for um, our programs to help to give our learners a, a, a democratic voice. So that's to say, a to which is where they are now living. And uh, another objective in the ESOL strategy is to ensure that the learners somehow get some kind of input uh, in the content of the learning program. Uh, to have some kind of ownership or some kind of uh, involvement in deciding what the content of their program should be. Uh, then, in addition to all of this, there's all the various other agendas which uh, surround uh, the, the further education sector at the moment, um, and I suppose you saw in Scotland in various other contexts as well. Uh, in in FE, the employability agenda is a very big deal at the moment. Um, the Developing the young workforce policy document is um, uh, having a very big influence on, on the entire FE curriculum across all subject areas. We are expected to be doing something to develop the employability of our students. 
uh, curriculum for excellence. Obviously, there are the four capacities which we're expected to to be addressing um, within our curriculum. Citizenship is perhaps less uh, of an of a, an overt need as it as it was because obviously it's no longer possible for uh, students to just do a college course, gain SQA accredited qualifications, and then use that directly towards a citizenship application. But there are still the kind of the perhaps the, the softer elements of citizenship are still very important with regard to uh, uh, encouraging our students to be a bit more actively participative in, in, in their local community and in their, the society that, they, that they're now living in. Uh, environment, sustainability, and equality, diversity, and inclusion, these are also areas which you know, we, we are kind of expected to be addressing somehow, even if it just uh, is some kind of thread. But, Somehow, these need to be included within our curriculum as well. Uh, equality, and diversity, and inclusion. Uh, the, the whole EDI agenda. I think um, it's it's a common thing for ESOL providers to be quite complacent about that because I think we tend to think, oh well, you know, we we've got students from all kinds of different cultures. Cultural diversity is a a, a necessary and a kind of a daily a kind of topic within our within our programs. But of course, the other Areas to focus on, you know, EDI is not just about cultural diversity. There's also things like uh, gender issues, sexuality, disability awareness, um, and these types of issues are very often not uh, focused on overtly in uh, a course book or in, in many kind of ELT published materials. Um, so we were looking at all of this stuff and basically realizing that. We're going to have to come up somehow with a curriculum that um, leads towards more accredited qualifications than we were giving at the time, uh, which addressed all these various different agendas um, within within the program, and which also somehow allowed the learners to have some kind of input on the on the program as well. Um, so that seemed like quite a challenge. That looked pretty daunting. Um, but then we thought, well, you know, not it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Change doesn't have to be bad. And um, just because these things are being imposed on us, that doesn't necessarily mean that, 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 that it's negative. And if you look at them, um, actually, if we just go back to that slide, if you look at the various different um, factors that were starting to influence our curriculum, not, None of that's particularly bad. In fact, it would it would be very nice if we could have a curriculum that gave our students lots of qualifications that they can use in their lives, which focused on all, all of these topics, which are actually very useful and very interesting and very important for people who are living in this country, and um, any, anything that allows them to have some kind of input and, and develop some kind of ownership over the curriculum also seems like a positive thing. So, you know. We thought maybe we can develop a curriculum that could actually turn out to be very positive. So we um, started looking at this. This is my colleagues and I at Clyde Bank College, as it still was at the time. And we thought, right, hang on. How about if we were to develop a series of different projects which focus on various different topics, which we've already identified as being important, topics related to citizenship, to, to health and well-being, to employability, to EDI and the environment, we could we could look at projects that, that focus on these various different topics, and then while completing these projects, um, we could find a way to allow the students to attain accredited qualifications. Obviously, the ESOL qualifications, but also we identified a number of other uh, SQA accredited qualifications in core skills or essential skills or personal development, those types of areas, um, which we thought would actually, uh, we could use them to enhance our, our curriculum. And uh, obviously, these, these types of units, things like working with others or ICT uh, event organization, th these are units that are not actually developed. They're not designed for ESOL learners, per se. They're actually designed with Scottish students in mind. Uh, 
so we were a little bit unsure, but then after looking at the, the assessment support packs and also speaking to our future colleagues, because we were about to merge with, with uh, Reed Care College over in Paisley, uh, and they were already using, they were already delivering some of these units within their curriculum, so we knew that it was possible. Um, and we thought, right, okay, if we can identify a way to do this in a, in a kind of principled way through the delivery of uh, project work, then this could, this could really enhance our program and, and, and uh, add to the, the outcomes, the accredited outcomes that our students are getting. Um, and then we also thought, of course, if it's a, if it's a project, then it's by definition going to allow the learners to have some kind of input and some kind of control and, and ownership over it. Uh, and therefore that kind of leads towards them having more of a more of a voice and more kind of autonomy. And also if you look at the four capacities for curriculum for excellence, so there are opportunities for them to develop uh, those capacities as well. So um that that's kind of the, 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 the vision, I suppose, that we developed in terms of a project-based syllabus that we could be delivering. Uh, it's, that's, we're still not there yet, I have to confess. You know, th this is still very much a work in progress, but th that, that's the kind of, uh, those are the kind of principles of program design that we were working on. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of some projects that we have done recently, just to give you a a kind of idea of uh, the, the sort of uh, activity that our students have been have been working on. Um, this is uh, a, a project title that we gave to uh, an upper intermediate class, um, and this was to allow them to generate the evidence that can be used to deliver uh, to to achieve the event organisation unit uh, at level five, and. Uh, one of our groups then decided that they would organize a, a kind of Burns Cayley, Burns Night. So they obviously had to do a lot of research to find out what um, that was all about, what a Burns Night involves. They organized the catering, they got a Cayley band in, uh, they had to get the venue, obviously, a guest speaker who came and did an address to the Haggis, uh, they had dancing, and um, yeah, it was a very, very successful event. Um, Here's another one. This is one that I did with uh, a pre-intermediate class of mine. Um, the, the topic we had was education, and uh, they basically this was to focus them on uh, uh, achieving some of the outcomes for the ICT unit at level three, and uh, they uh, basically had to do a, it was like a comparative study really, uh, searching two different types of education and then create a PowerPoint document. So that, that's a picture of them visiting Scotland Street School Museum um, and learning all about what education used to be like in Scotland. And then some of them did a com sort of compared education in the past with education now. Some of them compared education in their own country with education in Scotland. Um, but you know, it, it developed some critical thinking skills as well as the IT skills, I think. Um, this one, uh, also with the same class at pre-intermediate level, for their problem-solving unit, we focused on the topic of health and well-being. I don't have a photo, unfortunately, so just that. Uh, and uh, they they had to identify an aspect of their health or their well-being that they wanted to improve, and then work out a plan to do that. So a number of them went on diets. Uh, others started going to the gym or took up a new form of exercise. Um, some of them decided to kind of change their, their work-life balance so that they could spend more time with their kids. There was one person um, just decided that they would read their child a story every night uh, for a, for a, it was a four-week period. Um, so they were actually doing, as part of their ESOL project, they were actually doing things that really enhanced their, their lives. Um, so quite a valuable thing to do. Um, this one is one that I did very recently with my elementary class. Um, so this is a very, very low level class. Um, basically they had to organize some kind of activity, very general, but the focus was just on, on life in Scotland. Um, one of the groups decided to uh, create a little party in the class. 
uh, to celebrate Valentine's Day. It was, you know, this was just last month. It was Valentine's Day, so it, they, it seemed appropriate to them. So they made up some games, um, which they got the other students to do. They they had a, they did some research, obviously, on on what Valentine's Day was like and what people do in Scotland, and then they they had a little uh, quiz for the other students to to answer. So you know, it was quite a it was a fun activity, but also a fair amount of learning involved as well. Um, this is one with uh, level four. Um, so these are students who are working. They're they're doing national four ESOL, but um, also this was for their working with others unit. Um, and basically, we asked them to do a fundraising activity, and it was a charity of your choice as well. So this was one group. They just organised an event where they went to, they, they they basically booked a room in the college, and they they had all kinds of little fundraising activities. You know, kind of tombola, um, little games. Um, they they had they had um, food and and, uh, and coffee and tea on sale as well, and buckets just for donations. Uh, they chose to raise the money for York Hill uh, Children's Hospital, and as you can see from the picture, they raised three hundred pounds um, just from that one event. And actually, over the over the, the this academic year, so since August two thousand and fifteen, uh, in our college, the various different ESOL classes and different fundraising activities, we've raised over sixteen hundred pounds. Well, I say we've raised; the students have raised over sixteen hundred pounds for. Uh, various different charities, which I think is a, a really good achievement. It's great to see the students engaging with that type of activity, and 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 to have such a uh, for it to be having such an impact in terms of the amount of money that they're raising as well. I think it's really good. So, um, what I I've been trying to do here is just to to describe some projects, um, real ones, things that we've actually done, which I feel are motivating for our students, which are engaging, relevant. Uh, useful in terms of the skills that they develop, um, and also they they provide opportunities to to attain uh, qualifications, accredited qualifications, which again have uh, that also has a value, and that's all very nice. And you know, in some respects, we could maybe just stop there. But the the thing is uh, about project based learning, and this is something that's kind of niggled me quite often when I hear people talking about it is 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 this thing um at the end of the day we are still teaching it's a language program you know and at some point we do still have to teach them stuff uh, or or do we you know i suppose there is that side of it um you could argue that if they're just doing the doing the activities that in itself is going to allow the learning to just kind of naturally take place, and if you like, you can go all the way back to Aristotle to uh, to back that idea up, or you could just go back as far as Stephen Krashen, uh, who was writing in the sort of late 70s and early 80s, and his his acquisition learning hypothesis uh, is sort of suggests that the the second language acquisition is very much like first language acquisition, and therefore. Uh, it's it, it's really just a a, a question of of uh, language being acquired uh, almost subconsciously, and that any sort of overt focus on language teaching and on language rules is is kind of a, a bit of a waste of time, really. Now, I I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I feel that um, if you're working with adult learners, they already have a first language. They've got the capacity to compare their second language with the first language. They've got the capacity to to to. Uh, they've got cognitive skills that they can use to to identify rules, to to apply rules, and to think about language in that kind of sophisticated way that babies obviously don't. Um, and I just feel that um, if you're working with adult learners, to to avoid doing that, to avoid. Uh, Allowing students to use those cognitive skills is, is really a bit of a waste of time, uh, or, or or an opportunity missed, let's call it. Um, so I'm going to sort of now focus on on language learning and and some of the kind of very commonly widely held theories or principles of language acquisition, and I want to try and argue, I suppose. That taking a project-based approach to to language learning is actually 
a very effective way of teaching language, or it certainly can be. Um, you know, it is possible to, to to do project work with your students and just never focus on language at all. But um, that doesn't mean that it has to be like that. You 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 absolutely can focus on on language, and, and I'm going to try and explain how to do that. So. Um, First of all, if we look at the sort of guiding principles um, for for language input, um, I've got I've got four principles that I'm going to kind of put to you here, which are are, are reasonably well widely accepted. Uh, this is the first one. So, you know, th this is something that um, Jane Willis has been talking about uh, with task-based learning since you know since the early 90s. Uh, Michael Long has has, has written, written about it more recently. Scott Thornby also also talks about um, about this, the fact that students there, there isn't a kind of set order in which uh, people learn, uh, and when you've got a class of students together, they're not all going to be learning the same thing. So what this really means then is that the whole idea of a a kind of lockstep linear approach to language teaching, you know. Today I'm going to teach them this piece of language. Tomorrow I'm going to teach them the next piece of language. It's it's really based off false assumption. It's based on this assumption that uh, the students are going to learn language in the order in which it's being presented to them, and, and that isn't actually the case. Um, the, the the other thing that, that you can draw from that then, of course, is different students within that class. Are all going to be learning different things within the same lesson. So, you know, you might go in as a teacher. You know, a teacher might go into a classroom with a language aim. You know, today I'm going to teach them the present perfect simple, or, or uh, I've got these ten lexical items, and that's my that's my target language for today. Uh, just because uh, the teacher has decided that that's what they're going to teach, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the students are going to learn. And different students are going to come away from a single lesson with having acquired different language. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's not a bad thing. I think you know that um, we don't need to get depressed about that. It doesn't mean that what we're doing is a waste of time. All it means is that we need to create an environment in which the students can uh, uh, have the freedom, if you like, to to take what they need to take or take what they are ready to take language-wise from 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 our lessons. Um, this uh, this uh, principle is really based on something Scott Thornbury's written quite a lot about this, but a few other people who I can't remember, <laughs> unfortunately, have been have, have been writing about this um, for quite some time. Scott Thornbury uses the phrase the point of need, and the idea behind this is that. Uh, if you put the students into a situation where they actually need to use a specific piece of language, and then you feed that language to them at that point when they need it, then they're far more likely to acquire that language. It's going to be far more memorable to them, and um, and therefore the, the the learning of it is going to be much more effective. And then the last principle that I'm focusing on here is is more to do with motivation. Um, if you Read any um, of the more recent work from Zoltan Dörnyai, who's perhaps the most widely respected uh, uh, writer on, on motivation in language teaching. He talks about um, something called future selves, um, the idea that uh, motivation can be done very effectively if we encourage our students to think about who they want to be in the future, and then to consider, right, in order to become that person, I'm going to have to develop uh, these various areas of language, or you know, they, they have to identify what what they can do, or how how they're learning, how what they're doing in the classroom is going to lead towards them becoming that future self that they want to be. Um, and I think if you ask students, you know, who, what, who do you want to be in two years' time, there's not very many of them are going to say, I want to be a person that can use the third conditional. Uh, that's, you know, I don't think they're likely to say that. But they they might say something like, "I I want to be uh, working in office administration, and I want to be able to complete all of the tasks in that office 
with uh, with confidence or something like that. Um, and then you can relate them back to, to tasks that they're doing in the classroom that, that can perhaps lead directly towards them achieving, becoming that future self. So um, if we look at those principles, then I, I, would, I would like to argue that if we look at those principles, we can see that a, a project-based approach lends itself very nicely to, to an effective uh, form of language teaching, a, a kind of language teaching that, that follows these principles. Uh, perhaps more so, maybe ironically, but more so than than some of the other uh, dominant approaches to language teaching that exist at the moment, which may overtly may, may appear to be more language focused. Um, they may not be quite so effective in terms of uh, leading to our students actually acquiring the language. Um, so I'm going to move on now, and I'll talk about three different. Uh, um, approaches, three different techniques that can be used to input language, to, to focus on and, and, and clarify language within a project-based classroom. I said before that it is, you know, of course it's possible to, to, to follow a project-based approach and never do any overt focus on language, and I think that might be something that, that is missing from, from a number of project-based syllabuses. But, um, here are here are three different ways in which you can input uh, language within a project-based program. Uh, this one is something that you might do pre-task. So, I mean, if if we look at a project as being a series of tasks, and uh, maybe within each lesson, the students will focus on a task or a couple of tasks that are going to lead them towards uh, achieving uh, achieving the, the whole project. Prior to a task, you, you may want, as a, as a teacher, you may want to identify some language that the students are going to need, uh, and basically just plan a lesson that's going to focus on that language, and then you set them the task, and they go ahead and, and, and use the target language, use the language that you've just taught, um, while they're completing the tasks. That's a very sort of traditional approach to language teaching, really. Um, it's, it's almost... PPP, isn't it, really? The, the only difference, I suppose, is that the whole thing is contextualized within the, the authentic and hopefully motivating context of the project. Um, I, I would suggest maybe that, that that particular approach works better when you've got lower levels, because when you've got a low-level group, it's easier to identify the language that they don't have and that they're therefore going to need in order to, uh, to achieve various tasks. Um, so that's that's an approach to language that I I, I'll, I do quite a lot when I'm working with low-level students uh, on projects. Uh, something else that you can do, kind of mid-task. So let's just imagine you've already set the students their project. They know what the project is. They're working on some various different tasks, uh, which lead towards completing the project. And then as they're doing that, you as the teacher, you're monitoring carefully, and you're uh, feeding language to the students as required. Uh, so this goes back to the point of need thing that I was talking about before, and how we can um, uh, we can give the students the language at the point when they need it, and therefore it's going to be a lot more memorable for them, and hopefully um, a more effective means of of inputting language as opposed to, say, the teacher deciding what the language input is going to be. We're giving the students the opportunity to, to identify what they need and then giving it to them when they need it. Uh, this is something that you might do post-task. So after the students have done something, maybe towards the end of a lesson or maybe after two or three lessons, you might ask the students to uh, look back at some of the new language that they have learned. But I, I don't really... Instead of talking to my students about new language, I, I've started talking about new, <laughs> new, new language, which is a little bit cheesy. But uh, basically, new language is language that is new and useful, because obviously not all lang not all new language is useful, and some language might be uh, useful for some students and not necessarily for others. Uh, and so they need to that that involves a bit of critical reflection in, in itself, in that they have to identify. The language that that is going to be that is new, but is also going to be useful for them. Once they've identified it, they then it's another one of my 
cheesy words, preflect, which is basically just reflection, but before the thing happens. So thinking very carefully about something before it happens. So they, they look at the new language that they have chosen, and then they think about the authentic situations outside the college, outside the classroom, where they can actually use it. So they might be looking at it and thinking, right, OK, I, uh, I can use this phrase. Uh, that's a very good phrase for using in an informal conversation. Next time I'm picking up my kids from school and talking to the other parents, I'm going to try and slip that in. Or this is a really good uh, phrase to use in a, a sort of fairly formal situation. Next time I go to the doctor, I'll maybe use the, this phrase. Or, or whatever. You know, those are just examples. Um, and then, of course, once they have identified the new language and then they've identified the scenarios where they'll use it, then, of course, their homework is to go out into the real world and actually use it. And then they, you can have further tasks later on where they evaluate how well they got on and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, those are uh, three different sort of techniques that I use and, and, I, and I feel can be very effective for inputting language within a, a project-based framework. Um, but rather than just listen to what I have to say, I would also like to let you hear uh, some of my students. So here we have Violetta and Aldona. They are former students of mine. Uh, Aldona is still studying in the college, actually. Um, and I asked them the question, how do you think project work helps with your English? So let's just listen to what they had to say. topics are useful for you? Yeah, yes, of course. Of course, useful. For example, um, education in, in Scotland. Scotland. Yes, and, uh, the, the law, law in Scotland is, is very important for us. If we live here, we should know about it. Um, a lot of different very useful yeah. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so if we go back to slides. So yeah, here are some of the quotes that came from, from Violetta and Aldona. What, what struck me with uh, the, the, their answers when I asked them these questions, the, the thing that they seem to value the most is, the, is this idea of autonomy and the, and the independence that they have uh, uh, and opportunities to personalize the, the content when they're working on, on projects. Personalizing the content, but also that sort of personalization in terms of the, the language that they are focusing on and that they are getting the opportunity to use. Um, they also seem to to uh, value the uh, th the fact that the, the the language comes from them rather than from the teacher. You know that last quote. Uh, you can get some. You can learn some stuff from the teacher, but it's not enough. Uh, and they they, they they identify this need to kind of go further. Um, so for me that that. That was quite an important thing, and particularly because I know Violetta and Aldona. I remember when they first came into the college, and if you had asked them when they first arrived, you know, how do you learn English? They would have said, oh, well, you sit in the classroom, the teacher tells you stuff, you write it down, 
and and you remember it, and, and that's how you learn. You know, they had a very traditional view uh, about language teaching. Um, however, interviewing them after they had undergone a bit of uh, project-based uh, uh, learning, they seem to have uh, changed their opinion quite a lot, and they seem to really value the the autonomy that the uh, project-based learning can give them. Um, so. I'm just going to come up with a few conclusions here before I pass on to, to Anne. Uh, so, from my part, uh, things that I have, have kind of can conclude from my own experience of uh, working on projects with my students, they do seem to be very motivated by non-language focused tasks. So they can identify skills, life skills, if you like, um, which they see as being valuable and useful for them uh, in their everyday lives, in their in their work lives or their personal lives, um, and this seems to be a very valuable thing for students, and therefore it's motivating. Um, I've said a couple of times how it's possible to uh, it's possible to maybe uh, s skip over language input during a project-based program, but that doesn't mean that you have to. It, it is there's plenty of scope. It's entirely possible to have lots of overt language focus within a project-based uh, curriculum. Uh, also, with uh, project-based learning, the, the, the fact that there is some ownership in terms of what the students can choose uh, the, in terms of the nature of the project and, and the topic that they want to focus on or, or the specifics of the project, they like the, the fact that they can go off and it's not just pursuing content that they're interested in, but their own individual language learning agendas. Every student does have their own language learning agenda. And this goes back, way back to the early 70s. There's nothing new, there's nothing revolutionary about the, the, the theory that I'm grounding this in at all. In the early 70s, Pitt Corder came up with the term, uh, the in, interlanguage, uh, the interlanguage hypothesis, the fact that every learner is, is going through a a kind of process of of uh, they, they they form their own type of English, if you like, while they're uh, while they're learning, and they'll, they'll make mistakes and there'll be errors, but those errors are part of their interlanguage until they until they overcome them and they they start to acquire the accurate form. And um, this this there is freedom for that to happen within a project-based syllabus, which perhaps doesn't exist within a more linear. Uh, predetermined structural syllabus. Um, so, uh, I suppose my final concluding comment, and one that I think is perhaps very important, is the fact that uh, a lot of these widely accepted views about language acquisition are entirely congruent with a project-based approach to learning. Perhaps more so, uh, they're perhaps more congruent with project-based learning than they are with that kind of lockstep linear uh, structural syllabus, which which tends to dominate a, a large number of of, um, of English language programs in the world today. So, I suppose that those are all my conclusions now, and I'm I'm going to hand you over to Anne, and Anne is going to to talk to you more about how following pro a project based approach, so doing some of the activities like the ones that I've suggested in my part of the talk, uh, can be used to generate evidence, which can then be used. Um, for the current SQA ESOL units. So I'll just pass you over to Anne now. Thanks. OK. Thank you very much, Steve. That's really interesting. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I first heard Steve talking about the project-based approach to learning last year, and my instant thought, although he wasn't actually talking about the ESOL uh, qualifications, was that's the perfect way to produce evidence for the ESOL units as well as the other units. And in fact, some of the evidence you're producing in the units that Steve mentioned could also be used as evidence for the ESOL units. So I want to say a little bit more about this. Um, and just take you through some of my thoughts on how you can put that evidence together. Um, OK, so assessment doesn't need to be a test. And I'm saying that 
basically I'm saying that because we've just finished verification at um, SQA round one where we were looking at units and what we're finding is nearly every center is sending in evidence which is based on the unit assessment support packs, the assessments you can download from the secure site. So this is an opportunity really to remind you that those are just examples and although we've had really good feedback on some of the topics and themes that seem to be relevant to learners, we know that learners are interested in many other things as well and this project-based approach really gives them the opportunity to explore that and to get to achieve their um, ESO units. Okay, so why why are we still getting everything um, from the assessments that you're using from the secure site? I think I think people f have found it quite a good approach. There's been, as I said, good feedback on themes and topics. There's been a lot of other feedback as well, but that's not the topic of today. So um, I think I'll concentrate on the themes and topics. It's a good approach with large classes. It's easy to manage and easy to handle. But what I really want to show today is that that phrase naturally occurring evidence, so things produced during learning and teaching, can equally be used to provide evidence for units. OK. so. Um, learning and teaching in the way that Steve's described it is very much about what the students want to do and this fits in perfectly with the idea of personalization and choice which is also one of the main principles of assessment uh, within curriculum for excellence okay um, I'm whizzing here a little bit <laughs> in terms of the the time um, that we've got, but I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. So the first one is, has anyone taken a project-based approach to assessment? And you can answer that with a yes or a no on the screen now. Okay, I think that's everybody. And the second question is, have you delivered the National 4 Added Value Unit or either of the Living in Scotland units? Yes or no again? Oh, that's interesting because now we've got, I think, a few more yeses. So if you've delivered either of those units, you've basically taken a project-based approach to um, assessment. It may not have been well integrated with the learning and teaching, and you may have framed it in a slightly different way. But really, you're taking a project-based um, approach to assessment. The added value unit is one that I think should have been called uh, the ESOL project because it fits much more with the way that we think about ESOL rather than the ESOL assignment. It's essentially a project and the students produce evidence that they've done some reading and in some cases some listening. They also produce evidence in terms of speaking and in the question and answer session evidence for listening and speaking. So we can see how they're providing evidence within that National 4 ESOL assignment. The Living in Scotland units um, are, again, a project-based approach. And there's um, the, if you like, there's the process by which they get all of the information, which can provide evidence for listening and reading. And then the product at the end. So that can be either speaking and writing or speaking or writing. So these, these are project-based approaches to assessment. OK. The next one. So in terms of your project planning, if you're planning um, a learning 
project for ESOL, you might as well want to think about, well, what are the students going to produce and how are they going to produce it? Um, so in terms of researching two different types of education and presenting your ideas on a PowerPoint, the students will have done some reading, possibly some listening as well. They'll have produced the PowerPoint, perhaps with notes, and they may well present the PowerPoint as well. So we've got listening, we've got evidence, if you like, for all four skills coming straight out of that. It, it also offers a range of choice, as Steve was saying. Some chose to do education in Scotland before and now, and others education in their own country and education in Scotland. So we're introducing that element of choice. There's a certain amount of work that is general input on that particular topic, but then the students are going off down the avenues that really interest them. So if they have young children, it might be nursery or primary education. Um, at, at least they're able to focus on the, the things they want to do at the same time as producing the evidence. Now, I'm going to skip a couple of things here. So. <laughs> But when you're planning, you're thinking about a title, you can also be thinking about what evidence they're going to produce and how can I use that in terms of assessment. Okay, so which skills could a project provide evidence for? If, if there's reading involved, it might be selecting information from different sources, leaflets, articles, they may be going on the website. They may be taking notes um, as a result of doing that. So what, what we want to do is, if the, if the assessment standards in the unit for reading reflect what we do actually authentically in real life, they should be able to provide evidence for what we're asking in the assessment standards. So we've got understanding overall purpose, main point, aspects of detail, understanding detailed vocabulary so that they can, if you like, make use of context to work out meaning, understanding opinions and attitudes, and looking at layout for clues as to the purpose of the text. All of that should be able to done, be done from looking at gathering information for their project. There isn't any reason why it shouldn't be. The same with writing. The product might be a questionnaire. Um, I did see a very interesting uh, project at West College where they'd taken the referendum and put together questionnaires that they then went out and asked other students, and I think people on the street, I'm looking for at Steve for confirmation. So they put together a questionnaire. There's no reason why individual students can't can't do that and use that as evidence. We've got reports, leaflets, notes. If you've got speakers coming in, then email, um, emails to them, invitations to speakers. All of these things are evidence. OK. And again, listening and speaking, it's the same. If we've got the assessment standards right, then then the students should be able to show by evidence they produce in terms of doing things and carrying out projects as part of learning, there should be evidence there. Um, and so conversations, discussions, conducting an interview, giving a presentation or talk as well as answering questions. I think the... Um, that perhaps the listening and writing is the listening and reading, sorry, is the hardest one to gather evidence for. And it may be that you want to do part of that as a general introduction to the project so that you could set something up in terms of an assessment around a speaker coming in or for listening or a piece of general information that's going to kick them off on the project. Okay, and evidence. 
So what evidence would you need to provide and what evidence would you need to keep? Project brief. So project brief, I think, really can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. It can be the title. And for the students, it should be what should be produced and some idea of how they should produce it. So either through listening or reading, they're going to gather the information. But that, that can be described in a very simple way. Or you can develop something along the lines of what we can see in the National 4 Added Value Unit, which is, if you like, guidance on an assignment. Um, as well as that, you would need to have the piece of rev reading that they'd done and whatever they produced around that piece of writing, um, listening and speaking, if you're going to integrate assessment of those a recording of the interview or conversation. So it may be that they are interviewing people. They can use their phone to record that. It doesn't have to be recorded uh, in a very formal assessment situation. If that recording shows they meet the assessment standards, that's fine. And a candidate assessment record or something similar. So in fact there we've got, what, five pieces of evidence. And I'm very aware of the time uh, here. So I'm just going to whiz through the last bit. If you're judging evidence and you're new to doing this type of project, you could design your project and see what the pro students produce and then judge it against the assessment standards. So if, you, if it involves a bit of writing and you think, hmm, that may well meet the assessment standards. See if you can credit the students with that. So that's one approach. The other is the sharing of assessment standards. And if the students are aware of those early on in the course, and they are part of what is happening throughout the course, then they can be aware of what they're working towards. And there isn't any reason why they shouldn't be in control of a checklist during the project which uh, allows them to consider what they're producing evidence for. OK, so again, checklists, uh, as complex or as simple as you like, have to work for you, and they have to work for the student. And in the same checklist, that's what I'm saying, can be used to record achievements. So look, you don't want too many bits of paper. That's one of the things we really want to avoid, is too many bits of paper. If you can use the same checklist for different purposes, do that. OK. And recording achievement could be done using, people will be familiar with this, the judging evidence table, and noting here in that commentary box, what's been done and what's been achieved. There's a real whiz through here. <laughs> um, OK. So ESOL learners can provide evidence for SQA ESOL units or and other units and outcomes uh, through project-based learning. I strongly believe that that is absolutely possible and that we as verifiers are looking for some of those more innovative approaches to be coming into us at verification. It's really boring looking at the UASPs all the time, so something a bit more lively and interesting would be great. Um, identify potential for students producing evidence, so you can think about that when you're planning. And then you need to retain that evidence and a record of achievement. OK. So you can see examples of the National 4 Added Value Unit in the Understanding Standards Packs on the secure site. The other possibility, until the end of June this year, you could request CPD from SQA. And I'll make sure we get a link sent out so that everybody could do that. And one of the um, one of the t ESOL team would be really happy to come in and do a bit more work with you on this type of project-based assessment. So that's an opportunity for further